Hey everyone, Steve Weintraub here with Collider, and I am here with the people that won the Sundance Lottery for Blinded by the Light. <laughs> uh, as we were talking at Sundance, your film is contracts are being signed, most likely, and you're one of the big sales of Sundance. Um, oh, if you don't mind taking the mic. Uh, what This has to be a crazy moment, though, because just getting in Sundance is a big deal. Having like a standing ovation and people being so moved by the film is a big deal. But then being one of the big sales is like, are you kidding? It's awesome, is all I can say. You know, being an independent filmmaker, uh, I have been a filmmaker for quite a long time now. These are the things that you read about, you know, that other people go through, and you know, you have the bidding wars and all the rest of it. So it feels really lovely to to be in that space right now, hmm. and. Um, you know, and I'm and I'm just enjoying it and accepting it because who knows the next movie might just go down the toilet. You never know. <laughs> um, I want to start by saying how much I loved your movie. Thank it is you. so so good. One of my favorites of the fest. Um, there's going to be people watching this that have not seen the movie and are unfamiliar, mm. and it's it's your story. So uh, talk a little bit about uh, how this all came about, this story, and you know. Um, so. I'm a huge Bruce Springsteen fan, and I have been since I was 16. And um, in my early 30s, I got contacted by a publishing company. So, would you like to write a book? And they said, what do you want to write about? And I said, well, there are only two things I'm really obsessed with, Bruce Springsteen and myself. And so I'll write a, I'll write a book about <laughs> that. That's so true. That's so true. You're right. Days. You're right. So, <laughs> I wrote, so I wrote a memoir called Greetings from Berry Park, Race, Religion, Rock and Roll, about why is it that a kid like me would like Bruce Springsteen, why a Pakistani Muslim kid living in a crappy town in, in Britain. As I was writing it, I was thinking, you know, in some fantasy world, Gorinda Chada, the woman who made Bendy Like Beckham, would make a film of this because it's got some echoes of it. She, I knew, I knew her a little bit, and I was like, she would be the right person to make it. I met up with her, and then what happened? And obviously, we had bonded before over Bruce. You know, um, we had lots of conversations about that. I remember, and um, and so you know, when he showed me the book, I was like, oh my god, this! I can make this movie. I know how to make this movie. And I know how to make it well because obviously being British Asian, like Safraz, going through the same stuff with parents, you know, I get that. And then I also get loving Bruce and what Bruce is about. So um, in a movie, what you have to do is transcend the elements. You know, you have to transcend your British Asian-ness. In some ways you have to transcend Bruce. You know, you have to bring all these things together to mean something else to an audience who is neither of those things, a Bruce fan or British Asian, you know. so. I think um, what Safraz's book gave us was a brilliant starting point. And then within the film, what I was able to do was work with Safraz, we worked on the script together, was really help push him into places that he might have been quite nervous to go uh, in the book. Because you see, what we do as British Asians is we want to talk about our story, but we also want to protect our parents. You know, we don't want to expose them totally, you know, and so we're constantly trying to find that balance. And that's what Bender Like Beckham was about, was finding that balance. So with Safraz, I knew that, um, he was trying to protect his dad, and he had a very complex relationship with his, dad, with his dad. But he was incredibly open and honest, and you know we were able to sort of really push to get that story to really mean something, you know. And also, there were so many moments um, in the in the movie that are pure Safras, age sixteen, age seventeen. All the poems that you see on I the mean, wall, the most they're all Safras's poems. One of the most amazing things about this production, I just can't, it's it's beyond crazy. Is and it obviously came from you, the support from everyone in terms of the production design and everybody to try and make it authentic. So, mm. if you were to watch this film and you were to f freeze frame on the scenes where where the boy is in his room and his poems and you zoomed in, those are my actual poems from when I was 16. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of crazy. So, so that level of authenticity then linked with yeah. your ability to be able to kind of get deeper. And, and I think our thing was that what Springsteen does brilliantly is, you know, if you listen to The River, it's not actually a true story, but it absolutely feels like it is. And I think what we were trying to do with the film was to have a film which at times is fictional, but always felt emotionally true. Yeah, but we also, you know, like I wanted to use that that interview you see. Uh, he's watching an interview from a BBC show called The Old Grey Whistle Test, David Hepworth, and Javid is watching that on TV. And um, 
we could have used any part of that, but the bit that I selected was the bit where Bruce talks about the river and talks about dedicating it to his brother and uh, his sister and brother-in-law who went through really hard times um, with unemployment and raising kids. And the question he's asked is, who are your heroes? And he says, it's people like that, you know, who keep the well going. And it was such a beautiful part of um, that interview. And even though the sound's really bad and I spent ages trying to clean it up because he mumbles a lot, Bruce, but I couldn't really get Bruce to do ADR. Um, <laughs> so I had to clean it up. But it was I, for me, it was like, if anybody doesn't understand the man by now, you've got to listen to this clip and then you will get why we're making this film. And I think um, what we've done is taken what we believe is the essence of, of what Bruce believes. You know, what he believes in terms of America, uh, a better America, living with hardship, finding your way through that hardship and finding a, a, a way to make sense of your life and, and acknowledging that life can be pretty hard, but then you've got to find the moments through it. Because the thing about Bruce is that he's not a fantasist. And so when he talks about decisions that you make or whatever, his, his music is one of consequences, you know, which is why, you know, you say, if dreams came true, wouldn't that be nice? But there's still a price to pay. And this is a film that's also about somebody who wants to get something with his life, but isn't sure if he's prepared to pay the consequences. So there were parallels with what Bruce sings about and what this character is kind of going through. Completely. I, I definitely have to ask you, what was it, what is it like going in, to, I'm sure you auditioned. Yeah. What is it like to audition for a movie like this? Uh, and how, the, talk a little about those initial, you know, those first conversations about the character. Um, it was uh, relatively like chill, I guess. Like the audition process and just like, where we auditioned, how we auditioned, it was like, it's pretty chill. I think the most unnerving thing was having to sing, <laughs> having to just sing a song with like no idea if I was meant to like flip in, dance around or something. So I just sort of, uh, that was the most. That was tough in the yeah. audition. He, he, I made the, the, the actors read scenes, but then I made them sing Born to Run. <laughs> with your like, flipping JBL speaker just sitting there on the side and you put it on like blast the music out and I'd have to sort of sing to it that was probably the weirdest bit but it was yeah but you did that really well you, that yeah. was one of the things you, you reminded me now you did that really well it's almost like you closed your eyes and you went into the music probably yeah. because you were embarrassed probably but it, but it worked I was going to say uh, uh, I would imagine that someone had to be able to at least sing with sincerity yes. that was very mm. important <coughs> well I think Thunder Road um um, Javid sings Thunder Road to a girl and like if you've seen Bruce live you know as soon as that harmonica starts mm. in the intro the whole audience is you know singing and then he stops singing and we all go she ain't a beauty but she's all right you know we're all in there and so that was like a, that's a big yeah. song so he sings it and then um, Matt's dad um, the actor, the British actor, Rob Brydon, Rob Brydon sings, joins him. Yeah. And it, I know for Bruce fans, that's a big sing-along moment, but but the way Javid sings it, it, he says it with real meaning. He means the words and he's singing to a girl and, um, and he made it his own. And that was important. Um, that was something I had to sort of figure out because um, it sounds sort of odd, but I had to distance myself from that and as I would have sung it, you know, like, uh, as I could have like riffed and fucking done stupid shit like that. Do you know what I mean? Like, sure. it, cause it's not about that. It was, it was, I had to find a way to sing as this kid would have sung. And I remember I asked Safraz, I was like, how do you sing it? How do you sing the song? Do you sing them in an American accent? Do you sing them in a, a British accent? Cause that's important as well. And Safraz went, just a mix. Um, so it's I like had to sort basically, of- Basically it's like trying to do it from the heart really. Yeah, so as opposed it, to, yeah. yeah, as opposed to, you know, going off with ad-libs and all of that because that's that might have been me or whatever but that's not him um and just the sincerity with which he sings the songs and and to some people it's like oh oh that's a bit to some people they might be like oh that's a bit odd that's a bit weird but the fact that he does it with such sincerity for me um is what makes it special and kind of sweet i'm very curious what is it like casting yourself in a movie. <laughs> well, I didn't. So that was <laughs> well, no, I had to keep his afros away. Yeah. <laughs> because I didn't want, I no. mean, you know, bless him. He's, <laughs> I, and, know, I, know. I needed, um, I need, see, the thing is, this is one of the hard things for, for Safraz actually, was because I kept saying to him, this is great, you've done it, and you've got to walk away. Mm. 
because the movie has to belong to him. Mm. You know, it's not you, it's him being Javid. And, uh, and then once you do that, then he, so every movie you have to take ownership at different times. You know, you have to do your bit. As a, as a writer, you do your bit, then you have to walk away from that. Mm -hmm. You do your bit as a director, and then you have to walk away from that, you know, let the business take over. You do your bit as an actor, and yeah. then you've got to walk away from yeah. it. And, and uh, um, uh, Vivek is relatively new. I mean, this is his second job um, and first movie. But I kept, and he was nervous, but I kept saying to him when we were watching, I said, that's not you, that's Javid. Mm -hmm. You're Vivek, but yeah. that's Javid. My only thought about it was that I felt like because you know, because it's a personal story, there was a lot invested in me, both in Vivek, but also in Kulvinda, who plays the dad. Like, I didn't want them to mess up, yeah. you know, because it was so important that I didn't want, like, for example, the, the, the big fear I had with the dad is I didn't want him to be considered to be a comical character, and I didn't want him to be a tyrant. And so with, with both Vivek and, and Kulvinda, all I did was I just spent time with them, and I showed them photographs of what I was like, and what, what my dad was like, mm. I showed them my poems, and then I did, I think I remember actually saying to you, this is just for you, you can totally forget all of this and just do your own thing. But all I'm doing is just giving you material. And if you want to use it, you can. It was, it was great to have that sort of source material. Yeah. So what I did was I got Safraz's book. I read it, had that source material, talked to Safraz a bit, met him, went to his hometown, went to Luton, saw his houses he'd lived in and grown up in. Um, and that was great. But I, it, although the source material was there, this for me wasn't based on Safraz. Because I see Safraz now, and I remember Gurinder telling me, you can't base this on Safraz now, because he's different as a whatever year old man than he was when he was, you know, 16, um, and ridden with, you know, all, all these different types of problems and his sort of teenage angst and uh, issues living in Luton at home, issues with his, issues with his dad. Um, so I sort of, I use that as a little, a little bit of source material, but sort of just went off it on my own. I definitely have to bring up uh, the fact that you got Springsteen to give you the music, uh, which is, you know, he doesn't, he's not casual about giving out his music. No. And you have, what, 17 songs? Yeah. So talk a little bit about how you got the music and what was it like, uh, you know, showing him. Let's start with how you got the music. Well, I think Bruce uh, knew no Sephiroth because he's seen him so many times and he's well, they're best friends well he's very distinct looking you know <laughs> I, and spent, in you know, I, I didn't have many uh, my, my relationship history was pretty poor in my uh, in my late 20s and early 30s and I spent that time when I could have been having relationships going to see Bruce around the world and so I ended up having a bit of a relationship with Bruce because I would always be at the front row all the time <laughs> so. how did you get front row all the time persistence <laughs> okay yeah. got it so he'd be in some place and Bruce would go Man, what are you doing in Pittsburgh? You know, um, and so when <laughs> when uh, we did meet him finally on the red carpet of uh, the Promise when Bruce came to yeah, London, two thousand and ten, two thousand and ten, he came over to Safraz and said, "I read your book; it's really beautiful." And of course, Safraz was amazed, uh, lost it. and um, he lost it, as he says. And uh, someone had sent it to Bruce. And I jumped in at the same time and said, well, we really want to turn it into film. Will you help us? And he just liked the idea. He said, yeah, sounds good. Talk to John. And so we then developed a relationship with John Landau and Barbara Carr and Tracy Nurse, who were with him, his uh, colleagues. And from that, we just, because Bruce liked the purity, I guess, of what we were trying to do and the authenticity, he just, he went with it. Basically, that's what we can say. What we tried to do, I think, was just think, not, not in a kind of naked way, but it's like, what would be the things that are the parallels? And because Bruce would never want a film that was just hagiography about just how great he was, because he doesn't need that. So, but this is a film that's about the power of his words and how his work has changed and affected someone. And as an artist, I think that must be quite a flattering thing. And so we, so the focus is on his words. It's not about on him, isn't it? Absolutely, but I think. Timing is everything. And I think we we approached Bruce at a time when he was writing his book. You know, he was mulling over his own legacy. He was thinking about a lot of things. And, you know, he's been very open about his problems with mental illness and depression. And I think, I think there's part of him that probably really responded to the fact that he had brought joy and meaning to someone's life when you know he struggles with that in his own life actually and i think and i'm just guessing this now having seen his show read his book thinking about our timing you know mm. so he was probably thinking about those things and he probably thought yeah 
well, you know, this is part of my story too. And here's a really authentic way of telling that story. And the thing about Bruce is that we couldn't have bought his approval because we wouldn't, he wouldn't ever sell 17 songs. So he, he had to do it for the right reasons. Yeah. And so in a way, it's the most hardest thing, but it's also the easiest thing because you just have to get something that works for him. It's not a matter of just, you know, opening your wallet. Sure. I, I have a question though. Like I would imagine that obviously the film's going to come out. I would imagine there's going to be a soundtrack. How does that work in terms of, you know, you have to work, you must have to work out all of that logistics prior to yeah. filming. Well, we, well, one of our, um, very close to production was Tracy Nurse, who's been his contact with Sony for 30 years and has handled all Bruce's music. So it was really thanks to Tra Tracy who made it all happen. So anything we need from Bruce, we, j we talk to Tracy and Tracy comes back to us and, or Tracy talks to John and Barbara. Mm -hmm. So it's been that kind of relationship. In fact, last night after a fantastic standing ovation and all the great accolades and reviews and everything, um, Barbara and Tracy sent Bruce some images some pictures of us at the party and some of the reviews and he wrote back this morning and went wow <laughs> he said wow good job best of all <laughs> what obviously he's seen the film what is it like did you send him a link like how did he see it and what is it like for you guys waiting for that reply because I would imagine it's like the two hours of agony well I was with him I mean I took uh, the print t to him in New York uh, to sit and watch it, to ask him afterwards if there was anything he needed changing or would like to change. And um, and it was nerve wracking. It was incredibly nerve wracking. Um, you know, we were tongue tied just seeing him walk past us on the red carpet. Never mind sit with him for two hours and watch, uh, you know, watch how we had taken his life's work and turned it into our own. I mean, it was nerve wracking, but our intentions were pure. Our reasons for doing it were pure. And that's what, and, and Bruce is pure, you know, and so we, we have that. And so when he started watching it, I was nervous, but then I sort of moved to a position behind him where I could sort of see his expression a little bit, you know, the side of his face. Sure. And, and I could see that he was just really enjoying it and lapping it up and, and he laughed, you know, at the right places and he was shocked, you know, he, at the, some of the racist stuff. And, and I think at the end, it was great. We put the lights on and he walked over and gave me a big hug and a kiss. And he said, thank you for looking after me so beautifully, which was like the most amazing thing that I could have you know, ever expected. And then I said, would you like me to change anything? Is there anything you want more of or less? And he said, don't change a thing. Just leave it. That, I love it. That actually brings up, I'm, I'm always obsessed with the editing process because that's the final rewrite. And obviously you are telling a true story, but you're fictionalizing because it's a movie. What, what did you learn in the edit uh, and from any early screenings that impacted the finished film before Bruce saw it? Um, if anything. Well, what I really did in the edit was I did a lot of the, the work on the music and the lyrics and the, bringing them to life, you know, uh, because we always knew we were gonna use these songs or, or or even less songs actually. But in making the film when I was working on it and working on how I was going to do like the storm sequence, for example, how I was physically going to make those words come alive, then new things started coming out. And then I used new songs. And and when we were, sh there were songs that I wanted to use, but I didn't know how to use when we were writing the script, um, like Darkness on the Edge of Town. But then we were shooting a scene. And I, as we were shooting it, I just had this idea that, I'm gonna just do a track in while the dad's talking in the back rather than, rather than do it as a, as a regular scene. So I actually shot that scene as a regular scene with dad's close-ups and everything. And then I just did a track in to uh, Javid, just trying to work out what his dad was saying, trying to get away from it. And then I put darkness onto that and it works exquisitely well, you know, but that just happened as we were shooting. But then other things like when there is a sequence that Bruce really loved and people, uh, are responding to it because they're not expecting it is there's a sequence where Javid's sister who's into British Asian music uh, goes to a, what we call an Asian daytimer which were very popular in the 80s where young Asian kids who weren't allowed to go to nightclubs would get ready to go to school in the morning but instead of going to school they would bunk off and go to nightclubs and be in nightclubs all day listening to British Asian Bhangra dance music um, and meet their boyfriends and whatever and then at three o'clock get back into their school uniform and go home you know and so we have seen an Asian 
daytime out and in that scene Jarvid goes but he puts his headphones on and Bruce's uh, Because the Night is on in st- while these Asian kids are dancing and suddenly the combination of the two is incredibly powerful because Everyone thinks because the night is is Patty Smith. Smith song, uh, but actually Bruce wrote it. But then the one lyric that we're, we've used is "They can't hurt you now, they can't hurt you now." But that's against images of all these Asian kids having a blast, having a great time. And so a film that's been talking about racism and some of the racist, you know, horrific things that were going on in '87 for Asians in particular, um, and our character goes through that. Uh, you then see them escaping into music and Bruce's words mean something even though these Asian kids aren't listening to it. You know, it's the power of words and music. And those are the sort of things that I got really excited about in the edit. Um, I'm very curious. You see the script. You know what's going This is your first feature. Mm -hmm. You know how much is on you and on your shoulders. Yeah. What are you looking at on the script and looking at the film schedule and saying, I can't wait to do this one. And at the same time, the other sequence is, oh shit, I can't believe I have to do this. Um, oh, there were, yeah. It, the, the hardest, I think the hardest hurdle to cross was to, was to be prepared enough for the read through. Um, and just even to be prepared enough for that. So I remember four days or so before the read through, hadn't learned any lines, didn't know anything. Um, and four days before I went, I'm just gonna learn it all. So I just learnt the whole script in those four days or whatever. So I knew and sort of was on it, was ready for the read through, did it. And the most intimidating bit about that was just singing in front of people, just sat at a table, not in context or anything, just sitting in front of it, just singing, just like belting your heart out in front of all these people just sat around the table, um, which is oddly sort of intimidating, but they're great, they're great moments. Um, and they ended up being, sort of lovely, sweet, heartfelt moments where, uh, you know, some of the self-consciousness that I had as myself or whatever, I had to let go of, and you helped me do that. Um, <laughs> and in the end, it was just like, we were literally running around the streets of Luton, screaming, screaming music. Didn't sound good. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, like, it sounded... Because the thing is, we w- we got an earpiece in our ears, right, with the music playing really loud, and we were like, "Oh, grand, that's amazing!" Um, singing like screaming our hearts out. Grinda in her cans in her headphones just gets our voices, <laughs> so we're like going mad, like shouting. And then afterwards, she'll take her she'll take her headphones off and be like, "Yeah, a bit pitchy or whatever." I was like, "We didn't realize at all," but yeah, is it the singing bit was sort of intimidating? Yeah, but Badlands was horrific. Oh yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, Badlands was horrific yeah, when you did that's, that. That's, that's why you just put Bruce over like yes. almost <laughs> instantly. Yes. Almost instantly, Bruce comes over. Uh, it's so joyous though those those scenes of you guys going around and singing and mm. the the change in your life and the mentality. It's just it's so filled with joy. Mm. And I, I'm sure you guys must have felt that in the theater last night. Well, uh, yes. I mean, what was fantastic was the spontaneous applause that the, the, throughout the film, not just at the end. I mean, throughout the film, there were different moments where people just clapped, you know, and this morning the same thing happened again. And I think it, I think it's re, it's, you know what, the film, it, it, Bruce is the all-American singer-songwriter and he talks about a particular America uh, of his dreams and what he wants and and we captured that in the film and I think the audiences are responding to that like like we want that America you know Uh, we want what Jarvid wants America to be you know Mm -hmm. and I think that's what I'm experiencing here in in Park City at Sundance is American audiences reading the film like that we're like we're talking about Bruce and Jarvin and British Asian and whatever but there's something about America as as Bruce sees it it's about hope isn't it yeah it's they, hope. Feel, they feel yeah. like this is a reminder of a hopeful America and a hopeful idea of America and I think that's what people are responding to like joy and hope and you know you want that from films don't you I mean you're oh. American do you, do you think what we're saying is correct as uh, British uh, no a hundred percent and uh uh, there's a lot of, the the world seems, I mean, it's always dark, but it seems like we're dealing with a lot right now, more so than ever. And uh, it, the film, it, it you know, it allows you to see 
what we all want it to be. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. I, I, uh, um, I got I to gotta stop talking to you guys so you can do other <laughs> interviews. I'm just going to say sincerely um, a huge thank you to Kia again, the Telluride, for being such an awesome sponsor. I'm so yeah. happy for you guys being one of the big sales of Sundance. Thank uh, you. It's, it's just amazing. Um, and I'm so happy the world is going to be able to see the movie. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, thank, th you. Th thank you so much for coming in. I wish you all nothing but the best. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.